right. Hey guys, it's Brad Burnett and Merrill Chandler with Credit Sense. We are here going live and we're doing this every single week because for what, 20 plus years, Merrill, we yeah. have been, now we, by, I say we, I mean mostly he for 20 years, me 10 something, uh, but we have been helping people uh, and helping our high-end clients that uh, have come to us with some pretty lofty funding goals and helping them achieve those goals, whether it's buying a house in Monterey. Yeah, on the beach. On the beach. <laughs> uh, $1.2 million a beach house, so. Yeah, not a bad goal to have. Or, or even just getting funding to launch their business. You know, having people come to us who they, they haven't had a real understanding of credit and they've been struggling, or maybe they had bad credit. Yeah. I mean, I, I had the worst scenario I've seen in the last couple of weeks is 497 yeah. credit scores. But being able to help them and taking somebody from a 500 credit score to an 800 fundable credit profile. Yeah. The, the key being funding, right? That That's what Brad's referring to is for so long we've worked with really distinguished borrowers, right? People who are players in the game and they just want to keep leveraging and leveraging and leveraging. Um, more and more, and the more they learn, the more they can leverage, right? Uh, on our YouTube channel, we have this great video, it's called Turning the 1% into the 2, the 3, or the 4%. And you remember back in the day, there was this brouhaha about, oh, what, what, 1% owns 90% of all of the, you know, all of the wealth in America, right? Well, we can either fight against that, or we can learn the very skills that they have about how to leverage other people's money. So, while guilty, I don't know if that's the right word, while we supported high-end clients for so many years in establishing greater and greater um, fortunes and creating more opportunity for themselves, we're now taking this very technology and making it applicable even to buying cars and homes. Because fundability is fundability, guys. If you are fundable, you are fundable. And then it's just in degrees. Are you leveraging $1,000? Are you leveraging $10,000? Are you leveraging a hundred or a million, right? A hundred thousand or a million. So um, that's that's the point of doing our the Facebook Live for, for the this year. We have so much content that is going out there um, because nobody knows the rules of the game. Yeah. At all. Nobody knows the rules and, and we want to help change the entire dynamic of borrowing in the United States. Yeah. And and that's that's the goal is to help change opportunity, help help just really give you a chance, a fighting chance, so that when you go up against a lender, it doesn't have to be that adversarial relationship. Right, because how many how many of you have had the experience? Seriously, you go into a lender, it could be an auto, it could be a mortgage, it could be, you're filing online to do a credit card, and you're just quaking in your boots. You, you're anxious. You don't know if you're gonna get approved. And that wash of relief when you're like, ah, oh, I got approved. Or that, what's, what's wrong? I got, thought I had good credit. I got 750 credit score. There's, there's all this anxiety about borrowing, right? Because of this, I, this adversarial relationship that we all have in the back of our minds, right? So we're committed to removing that anxiety. I mean, and you're gonna learn over the next few weeks, we have tons of tools that allow you to know exactly what it takes when you go to apply for a credit card or a mortgage, you know before you even apply whether or not you're gonna get funded. You know, because when you know the rules of the game, you can win the game, right? So this is part of our educational outreach for doing these, uh, doing these Facebook Lives. Yes, and so, Without further ado, let's let's dive into one of the, the most basic questions that we we oftentimes overlook, and it comes from actually a, a question that was sent in to us. And so I wrote it on uh, the sticky note here. Tanner, who is age seventeen, I thought we want as low a credit score as possible. If you never want to uh, borrow money, yes, yes. <laughs> so so what is a good credit score? Okay, so. We're going, some of you may have watched this uh, previously, and we've talked about the difference between fundability and credit scores. But let's talk about credit score right now. All of us 
were, were raised since the 90s. Remember the guy when he was playing the guitar and he was dressed up in medieval outfits and he was singing about his credit score and all that stuff? Yeah, that was the first introduction of credit scores to the public in the mid-90s, 96, 97, 98. And before then, we all knew we had a credit score, but it was it was delivered to us kind of from the the merchants. Like when you go get when you go get an auto, uh, you get an auto loan or something. And they're like, oh uh, yeah, your credit scores were pretty good. And you're like, what are they? I can't tell you. It's against the law to tell you <laughs> yeah. what your credit score is, right? So much mystery, so much BS around the credit scores. It's never been against the law, guys. Just so you know, wipe that myth right out. It's never been against the law. It's been against credit bureau policy because they don't want them us knowing the secret sauce, right? right. Oh, I got a 720. What does that mean? Well, we still don't. Most people still don't know what it means. Yeah. All right. So the credit score is a three-digit score that ranges generally. There are, there are differences, but let's go with just the 80% rule that range between 300 and 850. Okay. 300 and 850. So those scores are the, it is the calibration of your credibility, your financial reputation. And it's based on a number of different things, um, but it includes the type of accounts, the, uh, the, your payment history, um, the length of the age of your history, among other factors. Right? So the higher your score, the better. Most of, many of us know this, but we have a surprising audience among millennials, and they don't know anything about this stuff, right? So the higher the score, the better. In an unweighted world, meaning um, there are, now let's talk about that. <laughs> Scores, uh, okay, I'll oh, go God. really light, yeah. <laughs> I'll go really, really light. Okay, I'm the tech meanie, and he's the guy, he's, he's the public face of, of, uh, of the capacity to get across a message cleanly and clearly. Me, I just dig into the weeds. So, apologize. There is not just one score. You don't have a credit score. You, there are dozens and dozens of software um, algorithms that calculate score. Some are FICO, which are uh, as we discussed in a previous one, FICO is the legitimate one used by 90 plus percent of all lenders in America. Use FICO scores, okay? Scores. Then there are dozens and dozens and dozens of FICO scores, a term we use to describe anything that's not FICO, anything that a lender isn't going yeah, to endearingly use. Endearingly use. Yeah, we, endear <laughs> we endearingly use. Yes. So FICO scores are not relevant to lending. But the vast majority of you who, including our beloved and devoted fans from Credit Karma, all of you who use um, online things that where it doesn't say FICO as a trademark, they're all FICO scores. Lenders don't use those, okay? So you have multiple credit scores depending on which software you're using. And if you're going for a mortgage, there's a mortgage score, there's an auto score, there's credit card scores, there's insurance scores. You know they pull your credit when you go to buy insurance. There's an insurance score. There's an application score. So what Tyler is just barely coming to understand is Tanner. Uh, Tanner. What Tanner is barely understanding is he's thinking it needs to be low when it needs to be high, but he thinks there's a score. And I just want you guys to know, as you uh, as you go through this process with us, you're going to learn a vast education because when you know the rules of the game, you can win. Yeah. So. And and long answer to a very very short, short question. question. Now, as a just as a reference point, you can get pretty decent approvals on on say a car loan at six eighty. Right, it's not going to be the best approval, but you can get one at six eighty yeah. as long as you don't have any derogatory late payments, things like that. Uh, 720 is going to be starting to push towards the upper end of a the, the A paper for an auto score, but it's the low end. It's actually the, the low end of tier two for a mortgage. A mortgage. So it, it, the scores vary depending on what What is you're A after. paper? Yeah, what is A paper depends on what you're buying. 740 is mortgage, is A paper. 
720 is autos, right? Yeah. Um, 760, 760 for for um, unsecured credit cards and business lines of credit is the floor of tier. Now that you go all the way to eight uh, to 850, but we know um, in all of our uh, both anecdotally and from our clients' experience. There are scores, you have triple A at 840. I mean, there are actually bonuses and things that auto dealers will give you, um, uh, 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 business line of credit offerings will give you the higher your score. So A is just the floor of good. We yeah. don't settle for anything but triple A, awesome, marvelous. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so that's, that's what you look at when you're looking at scores and what, what makes a good score. The, the key to a, a fundable score is still going to be your profile, and that's a much different conversation. Yeah. We've already touched on that, and we're going to continue to bring in pieces of that information week to week on yeah. um, what it takes to and what it looks like to have a more yeah. fundable profile. Our whole our whole come from is the quality of your profile and how you meet underwriter guidelines, not your score. Your score, if it isn't backed by an awesome profile. It's relatively meaningless, guys. You can have it. I'll take a 720 fundable profile any day over an 820 unfundable profile. But that seems like, oh, of course you would. But so many of you out there think, oh, I got a 750, I got a 780, I got 830s. And you think you're way more awesome than the lenders do. Okay, so that's and being an, you know an arrogant asshole type of person. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that whether or not they give you the car, whether or not they give you the house, whether or not they fund your dreams or goals, your business lines of credit, that's when you know you're, that you're, you're awesome, that your credit profile is, is worth something. And that's the only thing we focus on, is making, it, making that profile spectacular. Yeah, absolutely. Now. We got a, a question that came in from Mike uh, asking, how do I phase out a lower tier credit card? Okay, so stop right now. <laughs> Don't do anything, <laughs> but you take this one. Yeah, well, no, so, so Mike, we, we uh, had a chance to talk. Oh, and <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, Mike knows, Mike's a little bit further down the trail of, of what it looks like to become fundable. Um, what Merrill just said is absolutely true. If you have a lower tier card, one of the, the biggest mistakes I see people making is they will hear one of our presentations and we'll talk about closing a tier four finance company card. Mall, and store. mall store. Mall store, yeah, that type of card. Or your, your gas card or your jeweler, jewelry yeah, card. Jewelry cards are all online cards. The Amazon, the PayPal, yes. those types Synchrony of Bank. <sighs> Uh, so they do a great job of what they do, but they, they're tier four, they're finance company cards. We talked about how we close those, but what, what gets lost in that message is that we close them very strategically. We optimize a profile so those particular accounts have almost a zero contribution in value. Correct. And then we put them on a closure schedule. The mistake I see people making is, is not knowing that last little bit. And what happens is we say, yeah, we close tier fours. They go, I have a tier four, I need to close it. And then their score and their fundability drops by 30 to 40 points. Yeah, All right, perfect example. So uh, a brother comes and watches one of our presentations. He comes and he says, look, um, here's what well, he does a fundability analysis. And he becomes a client. And one of the first things we have to do in the first 30, 45 days after he gets his plan is, is to close this Home Depot account, right? And so his score goes up like 20, 22 points. Yeah. It goes a, a, across the board and he gets this raise. He's like, you guys were awesome. I closed this account. You weren't lying to me in the presentation. These are bad cards. But he, you know, he still operates, he's a brand new client. <laughs> he tells his brother at the barbecue, you know, he's sitting there, you know, salting the MSG on the, yeah. on the old steaks. And, his, he tells his brother, my score just went up. I've only been doing this for like 45 days with these guys. And I'm doing spectacular. They told me to close my Home Depot card because, because it's a tier four uh, finance company card. It's a junk, we call them junk cards affectionately. Yeah. But it's a junk card and, and, and the brother's like, I totally get it because it's a mall store and all these things. I totally get it. I'm going to go close mine. His score drops 35 points. 
He's, he's, he's pissed off at his brother. His brother's questioning us. He said, I thought Home Depot, I thought these were bad. And I'm like, look, there are a lot of factors involved. Tell me about your brother's, uh, your brother's Home Depot card. Okay, his was opened up within the last 90 days. Our client's card was opened up in the last 90 days. So you're safe, you're gonna take a hit. But if you just go out and close out all your cards that have been opened in the last 90 days, you, you're gonna take a hit on your score, but you'll rebound within six months, okay? So we will say that. If you just barely opened it, the brother had a 10-year-old $5,000 limit Home Depot card. He just took into, into account the fact that he was told that it was a Home Depot card. We love Home Depot, but we love it over on the business side, not on the personal, because it's a junk card on the personal side. Brother closes the card, snap. 35 point drop in his score, because it was, as a, as a 10 year old card, it was contributing significantly to both limits, the average limit, average age, and the age itself of the individual trade line. So, Bad juju. Yeah. Whatever you do, do not close anything over 90 days because you do not know how it's contributing to your profile, right? We, as Brad said, we take our time. We, we have an entire algorithm that ranks all the value contribution of every card. We don't close a card until that card is at the very bottom of the ranking with a zero value contribution. Then we'll schedule it for, but we don't even close it that day. We schedule it for closing based on other factors, right? So please listen to what we have to say, take in the value of it, know that you don't want to open up more Cole, uh, more Cole's cards. I, can I tell you a story? Oh my God. So we just had, a, we, we just came back from an event in New Jersey, uh, in Dallas. And this woman, she was loved what we were talking about. She, she was, I mean, I want to do this. This is amazing. But I got to tell you right now, I'm never going to close my Kohl's card. And I'm like, okay, well, you get to do what you want, but you also get to not have an optimized, uh, optimized profile. She goes, I'll do anything you tell me, but I will never close my Kohl's card. So we, this is not the first time we've run into this. So every once in a while, we actually have a caveat in our operating with our advisors and everybody else where you get what's called a lifestyle card. Because <laughs> some people believe that about Nordstrom's or Victoria's Secret. The benefits are too awesome. You love whatever it is. So we have allowed, I mean, of course, we're not going to force you to do anything, but we have allowed for a lifestyle card. But I'm telling you right now, it will not be the best you can possibly be. Yeah. There you go. All right, so Mike, hopefully that answered your question. I feel like we did thoroughly. Um, if you have any follow-ups, let Mike. me stop. know. Just stop um, right now. <laughs> now <laughs> Todd, Todd just jumped in. I understand it's better to have cards from brick and mortar banks as opposed to retail stores. Ditto. You know, you know Todd pretty well. His last name is... Uh, ah, <laughs> Todd. How are you, my friend? I, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're doing well. Thank you for, uh, thank you for weighing in. Um, yes, brick and mortar, what, we, what we're going to call brick and mortar banks are more of a depository institutions. And it gets a little fuzzy. That's why there's tiers and uh, tiers of banks, one through uh, four, tier one through tier four. And then there's um, value of contributions, like 100%, 80, 60, and 40. There are some depository institutions that are online banks, and they are not a full tier one, 100% card. But there are offerings like, um, like uh, Discover that are not depository institutions, but they are, uh, uh, they're more marketing organizations. So we have a tier system that evaluates all of this. Retail store cards is just like, as, just as we spoke about, um, thanks for bringing that up Todd, with retail, retail store cards are the junk cards, yeah. are the low value tier four, 40%. Um, 
but brick and mortar banks, we prefer to call them depository institutions that are also brick and mortar. So those are the chases, the the the, the chases, the um, uh, uh, U.S. banks, even though they're t they're eighty percent are tier two. There's um, Wells Fargo and City, etc. The the big depository institutions that are also brick and mortar. Those are your best, very very best banks. Yeah, absolutely. Or best, the highest contribution to your credit profile. Yeah. We don't and, know about uh, the banking policies or otherwise. Right. Some of them, they're rather onerous, but we take them because they're the best for your profile. Yeah. Now, uh, Todd says he's awesome. And Dennis says, uh, hi, guys. So, De uh, Dennis. Dennis. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Dennis, how are you, man? We just saw Dennis at uh, Dallas. So, uh, hey, glad to hear from you. Did, did Dennis have any questions or are you just giving us a high five? No, yeah, just hi. Yeah. Awesome. Well done. Appreciate you showing up, Dennis. Hey, Dennis. Now, Dennis is a long-term. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw you under the bus, Dennis. Dennis, long-term client, five-year client, has implemented probably thirty percent of all possible optimization things, and yet this guy just keeps leveraging and leveraging. He just, it's like, uh, it, it's like he got a hold of one instrument and he's like. I love playing this instrument, right? And he just over and over and over and leveraging and leveraging into the millions, into the millions. I wouldn't even tell him about your, about your diamond project. <laughs> no, leveraging. He's doing good though. He's doing extremely well. So well done. He said fine. <laughs> um, awesome. Yeah, so. I'm, I'm well, we have fans. We have, we're fans of that, our clients. Yes. But absolutely fantastic. You cannot do this and not have fun because it really is playing the game to win, right? And yeah. you feel good about being part of in a winner's circle all the time. You, every approval is like, I just got approved again, right? I mean, that's a great feeling to have. Yeah, no, it, it absolutely is. Uh, one thing I, I do want to add to the last bit of the conversation because another question we had is are gas cards a good idea? And everything we just talked about. Gas cards are included. Gas cards are, are finance company cards. Yeah, they're retail. They're they're one the an, an easy rule of thumb. If if you are getting into credit and you're just starting to try to, to because you know you need to have credit or you know you want to buy something bigger in the future, the easiest cards to get are not usually the best cards to get. Yeah, millennial so, alert. All millennials, listen to what he's saying when it comes to building credit or post bankruptcy or etc. When you're starting out. Vital what he's saying, guys. Yeah, the you know the the gas cards, the jewelry cards. Uh, we we picked on finger hut a little bit, but it's it's not a it, it's not a, a thing we have against finger hut. It's just that we know eventually you when you want to get a house, finger hut doesn't bring the the strength to profile that you're going to need. Yeah. And so when you when you see it's a real simple approval process. It's probably not the best card for you, and especially if you can only use it at one place. Yeah. Merchanting, guys. Merchant yeah. card. If you can only use it at one place, it's not going to be the best card for you. There are other options. There are other solutions with just a little bit of uh, planning that you can bring into play that would be much better. That would be so, phenomenal for the rest of your life. I mean, legacy uh, yeah. accounts, right? Legacy cards. These are these are long term that will last you. And if you do it the way we tell you, it will last your children and your children's children. Long term benefits for these types of accounts. Yeah, so. and that's a conversation for a different day. Yeah. So we'll jump back to this um, difference between authorized users and joint accounts. Go ahead. Well, it. The, the, the big difference, to make it as simple as possible, when I get my credit card, I can add anybody I want to it. So I can get my my uh, Chase card and I can say, hey, you know what, Meryl, I want you to be able to use my Chase card. And so I just put his name as an authorized user. He's not part of the, he, he's not, he hasn't signed on the application, so he's not responsible for the repayment of the debt like I am. But he can use my card. Now, that doesn't make him obligated. A joint account would be where you and another person are both on the application. You right. both sign the bottom line. And so if anything goes sideways or not, you're both obligated for repayment. And one of the, one of the ways this, this really comes up, unfortunately, is, is when there are divorces. And you, you see someone in a divorce where the judge says, 
uh, the the male of this divorce is responsible for paying the house. The female is responsible for paying the car. And you guys go your separate ways and do your thing. And then one of them decides, you know what? I'm not going to pay the house or I'm not going to pay the car. But both of them, both parties are on the application. They both signed right. the obligatory note. Well, creditors, credit bureaus, they don't care that the judge said you aren't responsible for the car or you aren't responsible for the Listen house. carefully. What they care about is who signed the agreement, who signed the mortgage, who signed the application, who signed the final note. That's who's responsible for it. So regardless of what the judge said, and we see this all the time, sadly. It, it's, it's horrible, guys. When you are – when you – a court order cannot preempt – your contractual obligation to that card or that loan or that mortgage. Loan. Yeah, or whatever it, it is. You cannot preempt it, no matter what the judge said. He's responsible for paying it. Doesn't matter. The creditors don't care. The collection agencies don't care. Yeah, at all. And you can go back to the judge, and the judge can say, well, we can make him pay it to whatever degree they have that, that power based on a million different circumstances, right? But at the end of the day, it, it, it still affects you because you signed – you're obligated. So the difference between the big difference between a, an authorized user and a joint account is authorized users aren't obligated on the payment. They just have the right to use an account if you give them the card. Yeah. Now to, to add to this, a couple things. First of all, on the authorized user, you need to read your cardholder agreement because there are certain cards or certain circumstances that if the if it goes sideways and you owe a debt, the authorized user may be liable for the charges on their card because the authorized user card will be the, – the last four digits will be different from the owner of the card from the authorized user. You may be liable for what you put on under certain circumstances. It can be under bankruptcy circumstances. Now, I'm just putting them all out there. I don't know what your cardholder agreement says, but it could be under bankruptcy. It could be under where you charge it up within 30 days and stop paying immediately. Well, under fraud circumstances, the authorized user may be – most likely will be liable for their particular, um, uh, their particular charges, number one. Number two. I cannot reinforce enough. We call them the three Ds, death, divorce, and disability. Th those are the life-changing circumstances that credit can impact significantly or can impact your credit significantly if you've not done an intelligent plan on how to build your credit profiles, especially if you're in a relationship. So the, the judge cannot preempt any cardholder agreement. But for anybody who is going through the, uh, the, the divorce process or planning divorce, um, you do want to put into the judges uh, – into the court order something that can be enforced that the, the, that the offending party, the person who did not keep their obligations in the doors, pay for re or remunerate you for getting your credit taken care of, either optimized credit repair, credit recovery, something. Now, there's no guarantee that it's going to remove the derogatory that they caused to put on, but put it in the divorce decree that the offending party has to pay for uh, the, the recovery of your credit profile. You can do that. Yeah. So that's that, that does, a little deeper than I was planning to go, but I think it's great information, especially uh, you know, with, with regards to what the actual responsibility looks like. Um, the last question we had for this week was what uh, – well, it basically, is it a good idea to use a consumer credit relief program? Now, these are the programs, guys, that you uh, – if you stay up late at night, you see them come on TV. Uh, certain lower market type channels, you'll see these uh, commercials where, hey, if you have more than $10,000 in debt, give us a call because we can make it so you don't have to pay most of it or we can make it one simple low monthly payment. There's a few different – hooks and catchphrases they yeah. use. And they will use the term debt consolidation service. Okay? That is a that is a deal killer for your credit profile. It's like filing, subscribing to any of these will show up as an indication, a negative indicator on your credit profile. 
on your credit report. Um, if it's not on a credit report like a mortgage report, it will show up on your consumer disclosures. But your score will be affected, your profit, your fundability will be affected because what they're what they're you're saying is, I did a homegrown Chapter 13 bankruptcy. That's the equivalent of negative effect it has on your profile. You're going to tell them, I can't handle my bills. Remember last week when we were talking about don't make minimum payments, yep. and don't make, you know, a vary your payments, etc. because FICO is watching for subsistent repayment of debt. You go to somebody and say, I can't handle my debt. You just confess to the world. Everybody who cares, you just confessed, I can't handle my debt, I need support, and they're gonna gut your credit. Now, just going in that, any creditor who gets called from the one of these debt consolidation, and don't don't confuse debt consolidation with debt uh, loan with a debt consolidation service. We actually have yes. spectacular strategies to help you get rid of some of your um, your revolving debt by putting it onto a point producing, fundability producing installment loan. But that debt consolidation loans are different than debt consolidation services. Any creditor who lists that, th th there's a back channel. Um, underwriting software has back channels you, between lenders, right? That's how they know whether or not you're you're you have, you're lying about your um, about your income or other things that you put on applications. They sh share software completely separate from your credit report. In these back channels, they're going to cover whether or not you're using any person is using it, any one of the lenders have received a debt consolidation request. If you have, they're going to seize your limits. They're going to drop your limits. They're going to close your accounts. They're going to run for cover to protect their assets. And your score is going to plummet. Your fundability is going to become absolute zero. So, yeah. So, debt, debt relief companies, that their debt service companies, they are really not a great idea. That they're not. They they show up just like Meryl said as a bankruptcy is, is the equivalent effect on your credit profile. So tread very carefully in those situations. Yeah. There, oftentimes there are better solutions. There are. Our, our, we we unbury clients all the time from high utilization, high um, uh, uh, high marks in. Uh, their balance to limit ratios, right, called utilization. When they have high balances, depending on your situation, we can help by improving your credit profile, improving your fundability, and reducing your interest rates by half, and reducing your, uh, uh, your balances. So be careful. Again, soccer in a minefield, guys. Yeah. Soccer in a minefield. Now, Last question, we'll take it live from over here. Mike is back and asks, <laughs> what are a few things or a few steps to guide my daughter who has no credit to start building her credit? She's 22. <sighs> Without giving away all the trade Without secrets. Without all the trade secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, Mike. Is Mike a client or is it oh, Mike not a client? Hmm? Yeah. Mike's a client. All right. Um, first of all, you want to create a profile out of tier one, hundred percent banks for youngsters, young adults, people coming out of bankruptcy with fresh starts. Um, those need to be tier one, maybe tier two, but they got to be secured. All right. Now I'm going to give them the hint about secured, uh, 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 secured accounts. When you're interviewing somebody about a secured account, there are two types of secured accounts. Um, they're for credit cards, right? Let's call it a $500 limit. You put $500 in and you take, uh, and then they give you a credit limit worth $500. Um, don't do Capital One because that's going to be a tier two, 80%, and they're really good about doing lots of these types of accounts, but you're also limiting because every month that these age, you start aging a, a less relevant account. But there are tier one, tier two banks that will allow you to put money down, but there's what's called the graduating process. You have to interview these banks to know that, because most of them, the vast majority of them, will give you a secured credit card, 
And then when you're ready to get an unsecured credit card, they will close down the one. Let's say it's two years old. They close it down. Now you got zero months on your, uh, on your aging. And then they apply for and get a new unsecured card. So now you have two zero month cards because one's closed and one is just brand new. That doesn't help your aging at all. So you need to interview your banks to see whether or not they will graduate from unsecured to secure, excuse me, that they graduate from secured to unsecured. That graduation process lets you keep the aging and once you get your money back, it allows you to grow. So ultimately your daughter is going to need an automobile loan and eventually to round out the FICO, perfect FICO profile, a mortgage, whether she's on one with you or a real estate investment property that she's on. So you need, you need a few, it depends, the profiles are different. So I can't say you need two or you need seven, right? But you need a few um, tier one cards that you're probably gonna have to start out with secure yep. if she's just 22. Um, let me throw this in there. If you go for a student card, make sure you see on paper that they will graduate a student card into a regular card because sometimes they're the same way. A student card they may never let get over $2,000. That doesn't help you in building a robust profile where you have 10, 20, 30, $50,000 credit cards, which you can then leverage your equity. You don't have to use that money, but you want to be able to show that you can manage that much money. So your daughter has a Make sure that she, you're a client, make sure she talks to us. Make sure that we can instruct, find out the details about her situation and then we can instruct her and build an optimization plan from the ground up. Yeah. We do that a lot of time for our real estate investors. Um, their children, they'll sign up their children and we'll build a profile from the ground up and start aging it and it's absolutely flawless. We have some that are over 800. My own daughter, she's 27 years old. 800 plus credit profile across the board, home, uh, already has her home, her mortgage, a couple of extra institutions, and perfect credit cards. Well, I have a couple investment properties, right? Yeah, oh, oh, she's working on her second, second one. Okay. She, she, has, she bought one, lived in it, fixed it up, and now she's working on her second one. But she's already doing everything that yeah. I, a, a proud optimi optimizing <laughs> father would be, you know, thrilled with, so. There you <laughs> go. Good so, job, Cher. Yeah, right. All right, well, that's gonna be it for today. Uh, if you have any other questions, when you see this video, send us send questions in. in the comments. Let us know. Uh, if, you, if you would like to get a little bit of assistance and you have some real specific questions that you don't wanna put online, uh, email us, info at creditsense.com. That, that goes right to our fundability team. They can answer questions, and if we need to, they can direct them up the, the channel through the advisor team. So thanks for joining us. Absolutely. And we will you see you next week. Yeah. Same time, same channel to answer more questions about fundability and optimization. You guys take care.